Welcome to a Break in the Action podcast. Here we'll take a break from the tactical and spend our time on the traditional, the Break Action Double Barreled Shotgun. Join us each week for discussion and interviews centered around vintage and modern shotguns, outdoor pursuits, and sporting literature. So sit back and relax as we take a break in the action. Here's your host, shotgun collector, wing shooter, and sporting clays enthusiast, Ryan Dowdy. Of all the shotguns that have come and gone in my collection, by far the fewest have been chambered in 410 bore. This is definitely due to availability. Far less 410s have been made than, say, a 12 or 20 gauge, but it's also due to economy. They're just typically more expensive. You might have picked up on the fact that I said 410 bore instead of 410 gauge. This is because the old standard measure for gauge the number of solid lead balls the diameter of the barrel needed to equal one pound doesn't apply to the 410. Although I haven't confirmed it, a 410 bore is said to be the equivalent of a 67 and a half gauge. 410 refers to the bore measured in one thousandths of an inch, so the 410 measures 410 one thousandths of an inch in diameter. All this math aside, truth be told, I'm a lousy shot with one. Ballistically speaking, the 410 can be summed up as having less shot, less powder, and less range than his 12, 16, 20, and 28 gauge cousins. They're often put in the hands of young shooters because of their non-existent recoil, but if we're being honest, they're better reserved for more skilled shooters who can quickly identify the flush game and a good shot, but also recognize the lethal limits of this shotgun. My guest today is Charlie Jordan. You're probably familiar with his Missing Sucks website and the excellent content there and on his Instagram feed. If you aren't familiar with his brand, the mission statement says it all. That through our sporting poetry, wild game recipes, thoughts, tips, accessories, bird dog stories, wine notes, locations where to hunt, and more, you're able to forget and feel better about that highly disappointing moment when you pull the trigger and saw nothing fall. After all, Missing Sucks. It's what I like to call a destination site, somewhere to escape to, especially in the off-season, daydreaming about fall flushes and distant bells on pointers. Charlie has been in and around the sporting leisure industry for years, but of special note today, he has for the past decade deliberately decided to use a 410 in the field as often as he's able. I'm going to get started by giving you a quick compliment, maybe. Um, you are a, a great storyteller. You and I have known each other for, I don't know, a year or so. <laughs> and just your ability to kind of just, you know, with words, tell a story, paint a picture. I love that. And you've got a you've got a really interesting background, too. So to get started, why don't you tell me kind of what, um, what led to Missing Sucks? <laughs> Well, it's uh, it's great to be on with you, Ryan. Um, this um, this little brand missing sucks started off, I think, about a year and a half ago. And I have a consulting firm, and probably just like you, working a hundred hours a week. And so I was doing so much travel, and continue to do so much travel. It, it stopped with COVID, but. Um, I was talking with my dad one day, and, and while I love my my, my work. You know, I'd been talking to my dad being in Asia and then in Europe and then in South America in the span of maybe two, three, four days. And so he said, you need to find something just to unwind because I know you love your job, but just why don't you try and just unwind a bit uh, from from work? And so one of the things that I love to do is, is read sporting literature, especially from the 20s and 30s. And so I always loved to. Uh, to, to read so many of that, uh, of those stories. And I found out that just by writing little excerpts or thoughts or, or things like that, uh, I really got a lot of enjoyment out of it. By no means am I an outdoor writer, but just writing down some, some precise thoughts and about how I felt about the sporting life always, um, always made me feel good. 
And then at the end of the day, I said, well, what is that one thing that, that, that is, as the bird hunting community gets closer and, and probably starts shrinking more and more every year, what's that one thing we could probably all agree on? And so I said, at the end of the day, I wrote down a poem uh, that introduced and shared with everybody the fact that it's a true reality that, that when we miss, it really sucks <laughs> for whatever reason, you know? Yeah. And so we just called it Missing Sucks. I was having a drink with my wife and I said, I think I'm going to call it Missing Sucks because I wrote this poem and at the end it said Missing Sucks. And then apparently a lot of people agree missing <laughs> truly does suck. And that's that's how it got started, because I think so many of us can can relate to just, you know, waffling a shot that just we shouldn't have waffled. And, uh, right. And, uh, well, and it, it's that it's that kind of self deprecating uh, kind of <laughs> uh, humor, whatever. You know, one of my absolute favorite uh, outdoor writers, Gene Hill was really good at that, you know, kind of, sure. uh, taking those jabs at himself to, to make himself feel better, to make his buddies laugh or his reader laugh. And, and, and I love that. And your, your site, you know, kind of brings a lot of that same kind of thing in. So just, <laughs> just to kind of, uh, jump to a, a quick aside, you've, you've just taken on, um, two new pointer pups, right? Oh my God. I'd never done that. My wife and I, we, we've always been dog people like yeah. so many of, of probably your listeners, but I had never, um, I'd never been in a position to raise and train two bird dogs at the same time. And we were just going to get one, but I told my wife, well, it's brother and sister. So they're going to ship the little girl. And so she looked at me and says, well, what's going to happen to his brother? I said, I think it's going to go to somebody else. Well, what, what are you going to do? You're going to separate him? You know, what kind of a monster are you? Yeah. And I said, no, wait, I, I, what are you talking about? Do you think we should get both of them? She said, well, you know me, I wouldn't say no. And that's all she said. So the next thing you know, these puppies are flying from Ecuador wow. where my dear friend who breeds them, right, uh, had the same line of my 13-year-old Daphne who passed away exactly 19 months ago. And it was the same line. And she said, Charlie, he said, Charlie, I'm sending both up to you. Cause I told them, I think we'll take two. And so with COVID and everything, we hired two people. They could not have, um, they could not have one person bring both puppies and they couldn't go in, in the cargo. They had to actually have a seat. Wow. So we hired two people through this great service. Uh, and the guys were texting us pictures of them with the pilots in the cockpit from That's Quito great. to Atlanta. And, um, and and so they arrived right here in front and it is unbelievable what a life changer this has been. Just, and you know, they're, they're inside dogs, you know, they, uh, they're inside with us. So it's two English pointers in, my cl in our Clumber Spaniel who have systematically just, just exploded in, in the house, you That's know, great. so it's, Certainly so something new for us. Their names, it's it's Violet and Sydney, right? I think we can yeah. follow that on your on your site. And then what's what's your clumber's name? Uh she is Rose. Rose, okay. She is Rose. And I actually went through a little bit of an issue, which I don't know how maybe you've had experience with this, but she was perfectly gun broke, and then one day she wasn't anymore. Oh yeah. I'd never had that happen to me. She was fine, you know. Uh I'd been hunting her with Daphne shooting the gun it was fine and then one day something happened where she just completely said what was that and uh a year and a half ago i started all over again with her and so i'm hoping to be able to get her back because she's got a heck of a nose on her but i've never had that happen to me before yeah. which no, was I've, weird you know i've not uh we're we're on our fourth uh, bird dog um in in my yeah. house um right now and i've never had that happen i've i've you know, obviously heard of dogs that kind of develop, you know, that, that gun shyness or maybe even have it right out of the, the gate. And it's always been one of those like panicky fears that I've got that, you know, this new pup that I've got, you know, what if they're gun shy? What, 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 oh then? My but, God, yes. yeah, but we've, we've dodged that, um, dodged that so far. So kind of the main, uh, topic that I've got you on here and want to talk mm -hmm. with you about is your, um, you've kind of dedicated yourself as much as you're able to hunting with a 410 shotgun, right? I have, I have. I think it's been 
12 years, I think now 13 years, just one day decided to go for it. You know? So, so, I mean, what was the spark for that? How did, how did that get started? Do you remember you that? Know, or? I, I do. I do. And it was about, it was about the birds that I was hunting. Right. And so I've always felt that this, and it's a feeling that's more pronounced as I get older, but, but I wish I could hunt and not have to kill just yeah. knowing the challenges that these game birds go through every day, you know, knowing the, uh, uh, the hurdles they have to overcome just to stay alive. I have been more and more sensitive, uh, to harvesting birds and, to, um, and just to making sure that somehow I don't appreciate, I, I never stop appreciating what, what they really are. So one day I said, you know what? Maybe if I go to 410, it might be a more fair chase or it might be a more, a, a more balanced chase, if you will, right? But the interesting thing was that even though I went to a 410, the odds of wounding them was so much higher. And so it's been a constant internal struggle for the past 12 years saying, you're going to 410 to give them a fair shot, if you will. But then the chances of wounding them are going higher. Right. And so that's been an internal struggle for me. And then over the past 13 years, I just fell in love with the 410, except for geese. I won't go after geese with a 410. Yeah. Um, and so I fell in love with it. And whether it's sporting clays or five stand, anything. Um, so the you're, you're, is you're the all in. You, you, you practice throughout the year. You sporting clays. You, you do it all with your 410. I, I do, and I think part of that is because of an, a, a little story that I think it was uh, uh, George Bird Evans that wrote, right, when he said, um, I hope that when I shoot a grouse and watch it fall, I hope the direct impact, the solid hit, uh, won't allow the grouse to suffer or let him or her know um, that they were involved in this you know, tragic death. So I've always thought that practicing on sporting clays might reduce the chance of, of me wounding birds with a 410. But at the same time, I don't want to let the 410 go as much because I think all of your audience would agree that wounding birds is just, it's got to be the worst thing on the planet, you know, right. especially right. a duck as you see it glide away. And I know we all, we, we all, uh, we all get sad about that. So the practicing during the year helps me make sure that if I am going to shoot at a bird that I folded like yesterday in South Georgia with these wild Bob White quail, I just wanted to make sure that it was centered shots that, that would go in. And of course, they, they don't always happen. But for that, I've committed myself to just practicing, practicing, practicing as much as I can yeah. to make sure that we fold the bird cleanly. And that, that, that adds another whole element. You know, I think, I think a lot of... Um, hunters are accustomed to, um, you know, trying to take a, take a good shot. Um, but with a 410, I mean, you, you've really got to give it a very, uh, it's, it's more of a cerebral approach. I mean, you, you've got to think it through. You, you might have a, you might have a good shot, but you also have to make sure that you're within that, you know, that, 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 uh, humane kill zone, um, whether it be range or whether it be, you know, your, the, the pattern of your shot, um, you know, when it, when it, hits the, when it hits the bird. So, um, I like that. Was it an easy transition or was it painful? So here's my humble opinion on the 410. I think 98% of it is in our head. Hmm. I actually believe that anybody who can shoot a 12 gauge can shoot a 410. I think we are so concerned. The fact that it's got, what is it? Seven pellets yeah. <laughs> in our minds. We're just so concerned. Don't get me wrong. Of course, you might have to sharpen up a little bit more, but I don't think it, uh, the reality equals what the average person like me would think of a 410. Oh my goodness, with a 410, really? I, I just don't think it's there. And I think a lot of people, when they pick up a 410 and start shooting and said, oh man, I'm, I'm hitting these things, yeah. you know? So I, I don't think it's that way. And I do agree with you that knowing your kill zone is key because just like Nash Buckingham, what was that 50 friend, 50 year friendship he had with John Olin of, of the Winchester company, right? They knew that 10 gate shells from Winchester, right? Would promote sky busting. Mm -hmm. 
And it was John Olin who helped Nash Buckingham almost start saying 10 gauge shells should be outlawed because they promoted uh, um, sky busting. Hmm. And John Olin did that even though it affected the company sales directly because it was the right thing to do. And so when I look at that kill zone and just being patient or just hiding a little bit more in the dove field, I just want to be able to make sure it's in the dove zone. One thing that I've seen with some fellow four tenors uh, do is that they try to see how far can you get that bird out there? You know, can you do that 55, 60 yard shot uh, with a 410? And so they do a lot of that, and I've seen wounded birds. I've never been able to do that. I'm, I'm ho- I hope I don't come across as passing judgment, um, because at the end of the day, everybody's own opinion counts. But that 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 kill zone saying, let's wait for that 30 yard shot, that 35 yard shot, 40 at the most, you know, to be able to make sure that with the practice and with your rational thinking of, let's just make sure it's not that far away. We can fold the bird. And hopefully it won't know what happened right before we start cooking it up and serving it some wine, you know? <laughs> so uh, paint me a picture of your, of a typical, um, 410 hunt. You, you, you are in kind of the Southeastern United States. I'm in the Midwest. Yes. You know, we, we get up here often to, you know, where you just about need to crawl through a, a grouse tangle. I mean, are you, right. is, would a 410 be your gun of choice there? Are you more open, you know, terrain? What's, what's the cover like? I mean. So here, um, just, um, what is it? Maybe 45 minutes away from me. I have a dear friend, uh, at Southern Gunner, who's also a 410 nut. And, and he, by the way, has been having a woodcock season that's just been, fantastic Hmm. we have woodcock about 45 minutes west of atlanta and they'll come in in december and in january right so we'll go into these public areas and so woodcock will take up a lot of our time the cover though even though i spent years up in vermont chasing woodcock with my setter tulula i don't know somehow the cover in the southeast is so thick and almost impenetrable and the woodcock which are of course fewer than in than in the Northeast are just so deeply embedded in there. And so that's one type of cover that we actually, um, that we actually um, hunt during, during woodcock season. The other thing that we do is we'll go, go down into Savannah and just from little John boats, start shooting some of those clapper rails. Um, which is a completely different, of course, ecosystem. You're out there in the water and you've got the high grass and you've got to play the tides. And those clapper rails are just such sporting birds. And that's a 200 year old tradition that, that is disappearing more and more. And by the way, they are delicious to eat. A lot yeah. of people won't eat them. Uh, and then the third thing that we do often is the snipe, which is my favorite game bird of, uh, of all time. We'll drive about eight hours down to Florida and uh, we'll start walking those those tributaries and those marshes of the St. John's uh, River area. And when these snipe come in, uh, that's just such a fast shot. And uh, and with that southern gunner, we'll be chasing them and um, shooting these tiny little birds that are just so delicious. Just yeah. cooking them with their entrails and everything is just so oh. delicious. Yeah, I've, I've never Fantastic. ever snipe hunted, yeah. Let's talk about shotguns. What? Tell me about your 410s that you hunt with. So I read years ago, um, maybe it was 30 years ago, I read one thing, beware of the man who just shoots one gun. I don't know where I read that, but for some reason it stuck with me. And so I only shoot one 410. Uh, as much as I love, you know, different guns, I just shoot that one gun. And the one that, that I've been shooting has been the, uh, I started with that 525 Browning, yeah. and then that's what convinced me. And I went to the 625 Brownings with 30 inch barrels. Okay. And so the 625 Brownings, which they no longer do, what, what I loved most about that gun was the weight. Yeah. And it's built on a 20 gauge frame, but the weight somehow helps my swing, whatever it is that you want to say it, 
it felt like it had some body. It's not a light gun. It's right under eight pounds. Oh, wow. But then you'll pick up another, uh, another gun like a Beretta, you know, 410, and it is so much lighter, and some people prefer that. But if I've got a light gun, and it's, it's, I just mount the gun and go after a bird, it almost seems so whippy to me that I couldn't be able to control the, the, the swing, if you will. Somehow that weight in the Browning is what I just uh, uh, treasure the most on the gun. So I'm probably the the guy that uh, would have would have said that about beware the the man that only shoots one shotgun uh, out of yeah. envy because you know I, one of my vices is I, I love shotguns and obviously <laughs> we've talked about do. that a ton <laughs> and I've I've got you know more than I need and I I kind of randomly will pick you know different guns I don't really have and always go to sometimes it almost depends on what I'm going to do and how I'm feeling that day, you know, and, and that might yeah. kind of dictate who gets the nod. But one of the things, and you, you hit on this a little bit, one of the things that has held me up in pulling the trigger on a particular 410 is I would love to add to my collection a 410 on a true scale yeah. frame. And and if yeah. Yeah, you talk about whippy, I mean they almost feel like a child's toy when you when you right. get all this together. But you know, a, right. a 28 inch barrel, um, you know, side by side 410 on a scaled 410 frame. Um yeah. I mean they're they're really, really something else. And you know the problem is there are infinitely less 410s built on scaled frames than there are built on right. say a 20 gauge frame. So, you know, these ones that, that I'd love to add to the collection, um, they're, you know, unfortunately they're sometimes just out of the the range of what I'm able to comfortable spending, whatever. Um, and Luciano Bosis, I think the, the, the Bosis 410, uh, that, that I've shot and, and I've been with Luciano are just, are just literally works of art or, or a matched pair of 410 boss over and unders yeah. you know they, they somehow just magically come up to your shoulder i don't know what it is i don't know how it is that if i pick up my browning 410 i think both guns will shoot well right i'll pick it up and i'll feel a certain way when i i mount it to my shoulder but then i'll pick up a boss right over and under 410 with 28 inch barrels and i don't know what it is it just feels like a completely different feeling yeah. I, I don't know how you do that. I, I have. I don't think it's the engraving that makes you have the different feeling. There's got to be something tangible in there. It says this is nothing like I picked up uh, online. Right. You know. Yeah, I've I've had uh, even recently I've had had some really good conversations with guys that have a far deeper um, knowledge of and experience with those those best guns. Those that you know that boss or a boss sure. or I think last summer you, you texted me a Fabry uh, that was about a $100,000 Fabry 410 over and under and uh, ah. that you saw for sale. But, you know, the, these guys educated me that, you know, building those guns, you know, it's every single detail is gone right. over a thousand times to ultimately make that just perfect kind of you know, gun that transcends all the other. I mean, it, it's 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 a, on a it's on a whole nother whole nother league, whole nother league. So, just beautiful. Yeah. Uh, do you have anything on your uh, your your radar? I, I obviously you you love what you've got. Is there is there um, a part of you that ever looks for something different or new or? Well, I've been talking to Enrico Gamba in Italy. Uh, yeah. I, I just love Gamba guns, and uh, I love you the and fact I both that for have 300... a, we both have a pair of Gambas, actually, yeah? don't we? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, I love the fact that the company, much like Beretta, for three hundred and what is it, eighteen years, has still been under the the, the Gamba family. You know, and uh, I said, Enrico, one of these days I'm going to call you so you can make a four ten. And, uh, and so he says, and he's uh, Charlie, I already started making it. I said, no, 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 don't, 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 don't start anything. No, no, don't worry about it. We got it covered. No, 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 don't do anything. So the closest I've been pulling the trigger, uh, to doing that was, has been with, uh, with Gamba. But, um, but now everything is up in the air with these two pointer puppies who literally are bouncing off the walls yeah. and not so much in a joking style. Will I tell you that? I mean, my wife and I are pouring drinks at maybe 10.30 in the morning these days. 
I've never seen two puppies at the same time. It's just the funniest thing. And thank goodness for uh, for my dear friend uh, who is actually up in Vermont and um, and is helping me with good phone calls that we have. His name's Alex Sparks of Snowbound Kennels. I'm saying, Alex, I'm doing these two. And even though I've trained four bird dogs in my life, for some reason, every bird dog I train, it feels like it's the first bird dog, yeah. right? For whatever reason. And so now we're going through the gun breaking and I'm a little bit more sensitive just because of what happened with Rose, right? So Alex says, look, I need you to have martini before you go out there because <laughs> they're going to sense the dogs will be fine. They're going to sense that you are a mess internally. Yeah. Um, but, um, are you, but that's are the closest you, I've come. Are you following any particular training method with them or is it just kind of a, a collection of things that you've done in the past or tips that you're getting from him or? Yeah, absolutely. Alec is, is helping me with a couple of tips. Uh, he's helping me see things that I've never seen before, but the way I've trained my, my bird dogs. And the last one I had was Daphne who passed away and I just can't think of a better bird dog. I just always had them fit my style where I wanted them to hunt close, even though it was a European English pointer, including Sydney and uh, Violet are European English pointers. Um, I wanted them to hunt close. And that has been a huge thing for me just to not have them range, you know, 800 yards out there, which other people prefer and it's perfectly right. fine. Um, but I wanted them to hunt close. And at the same time, just no woe, which we've been working with woe. And I think I've relied a tremendous amount on both my daughters and my wife to make English pointers who a lot of people may not have thought as family dogs, just make them those warm, lovable family dogs that they can be, you know? I mean, yesterday I was in South Georgia chasing quail and I told this gentleman about, oh, yeah, I got two English pointers. Oh, how big is your kennel? I said, no, no, they're in-house dogs. And he literally dropped it. Inside dogs, English pointers. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I've got I've got some friends that um, that that run to different levels of seriousness, even even very very serious uh, field trialing with with pointers, and uh, most of them uh, have never seen the inside of of a house. So, but you know that's it's 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 a different design, I guess, um, uh, for some of those dogs. So sure, and and I would encourage people you you do a great job of documenting on missing sucks just your you know the funny moments the the highlights and the um the successes with the pups so um you know definitely check out there so to kind of start to to wrap things up um besides your website i mean are you i know that you're you're you've got um, a great instagram channel i mean what what other where other places can people find out so well we're on, on we're on facebook and instagram and on our on our website at missing and uh, i'm just so glad that a lot of people i mean i can't believe we have thirty thousand followers i can't believe how many people agree that missing really sucks and uh, <laughs> um i was actually i was actually uh chatting with this gentleman uh, from uh from spain who's a big fan and um he was actually writing and says, you know what? I really, really don't like it when I miss it. it ruins my day. And then I wrote back to him and I said, I actually go into heart palpitations and I cry often right after missing. And he literally responded, really? <laughs> Me? And he always said, I think, really, are you being serious? I, I thought he was waiting for me to open up the conversation so he could say, I totally cried <laughs> when I miss, you know? That's funny. well. Charlie, it, it's uh, every time I talk to you, I have a smile on my face. You're a great guy. <laughs> this is Chat been with, Like I said at the beginning here, you're you're a just an epic storyteller. It doesn't matter what you're talking about; it's interesting. Uh, so thank you for your time today. Thanks for being on. Thank you to a break in the action. Love your channels. Love your your your, uh, your podcast and your Instagram page. Absolutely wonderful. Keep up the great work. Thanks, Charlie. We'll keep in touch. With Charlie's permission, I want to end with an excerpt from his poem mentioned earlier titled, You May Agree. But dearest of friends, here's something I'd like to say. It's something backed up on my personal experiences lived on every hunting day. That after pulling the trigger and failing to see something fall, be prepared for your world to come apart, for your breathing to suddenly stall. And it won't matter the game bird you pursue, be it quail, geese, snipe, or ducks, for the only reality that I know is that missing truly sucks. 
Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes and look me up on Instagram at a break in the action. Thank you.